Hello again and welcome to Tinfoil Helmets, your occasional spicy hot take roundup of the latest F1 rumors with almost believable conspiracy theories to back them up. Everything here is carefully researched for hours to make sure it's totally founded in logic, reasoning, and truth. Or not. Who knows? And Dominic, I think we got to start right away. It was a great week for the technical aspect of the sport. The UCI came out with a list of 400 elements for uh, of uh, new equipment and kit that's going to come out at the Glasgow World Championships next week or the week after that. I forget exactly the timeline. Uh, but yeah, I, I think it's great. We get a new Hope Lotus bike on the GB team. Uh, looks like Look's bringing some updates for the French team. You know, there's there, the Japanese have a new Bridgestone bike that looks very similar to the uh, the old Hope Lotus bike. And the Hope, Hope Lotus bike is still fantastically ugly. So basically what you're saying is everybody's inside the budget cap, but some people might not be. And some people have copied other teams to try and get a jump on it. Yeah, pretty much. Okay, great. It's just like F1 then. So the the way the rules work is like uh, cycling tech has to be available cons- to consumers. Uh, so to like prove it's in the pipeline and stuff, you have to have everything that debuts um, at either a World Cup or a World Championship prior to the Olympics. And this is the last race in the cycle, so we'll see all the the new kit come out in the next couple of weeks that'll be used in Paris in 2024. So it's like uh, rallying where everything's going to be homolog... Homo- I can't say the word. Homoglated? Homoglated? Uh, no, because you can do like fancy stuff like that's one-offs, but you have to like declare that this is ours and like that we've done it and we have a manufacturing process because... Uh, for years, uh, if we, probably in a pure intersection of track cycling and Formula One, was the UK was riding what is effectively known as the Uski bike, the UK Sports Institute, and they were laying up what probably had to be Formula One levels of carbon fiber onto a bike that is still being used today. Interesting, interesting. But that, that's what rally rally used to. Ha- you have to have a car in rally. You have to be able to buy it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you, to, you, you, you need like there, the 500 it's... models of whatever. Yes, yes, exactly, exactly. That serve as the basis that's appropriate for the one you actually race with. And if we're Lance here, we'll take 250 over here, we'll go out for a nice lunch, and then we'll take you to the other parking lot where the other 250 are. Uh, so, uh, in that brief sojourn into the world of cycling, which sadly I'm now watching the Tour de France Unchained, it's pretty good, everybody should watch that. Uh, but I'm trying not to get into cycling because I don't need more of that in my life. Yes, he- health and exercise, how dare you? Yeah, I don't mean health and exercise, what do I sound like? Uh, should we see if we've got anything right with these healthy athletes that go around in circles for two hours every weekend? Absolutely. Uh, so the first one we had here was Max Home Grand Prix double header. I don't think you meant at the time he would win both the sprint race and the Grand Prix because we'd forgotten it was a sprint. I'm not sure that's what you really meant because it's still his home Grand Prix. But he definitely won the uh, he won the first race of the of the home Grand Prix double header. He won both of the two Grand Prix of the first part of the quadruple header. Is Zanfor is Zanfor also a, a um, sprint race? I don't believe so. Okay, great. Thank God for that. Can't cope with another one. I think our next one is Qatar. Oh, that's a long way away. Maybe not that long away, but it's a way away. Uh, uh, so the other one is: Have we got anything right? Perez's last race in the main bull red seat. We'll see, but I don't think that's going to happen. Um, he he excelled himself today in his performance. No, I think there's another. I think there's more stuff going on. We can talk about it in uh, our wonderful segment of Does Blank Still Have a Job? Okay, good plan. I like that. Okay, more details to come. Breaking news. Maybe not breaking. Uh, well, maybe that's his problem. He wasn't breaking enough or breaking too much. Anyway, uh, between race drama. Uh, the first one. Oh, he. It's being moved live in our document. Okay, uh, no contract for Lewis. This was me. I'm making up drama. Um, if we all remember our minds, cast our minds back to. A month or two ago, where Lewis was like, yeah, I'm ready to sign the contract. And Toto's like, yeah, ready to sign the contract. There has been no contract signed. And there were suspicious questions from uh, the obnoxious Scottish guy from Sky News, who was like, uh, have you fallen out of love with F1? What did you lose? And uh, Lewis' response was, that's a very personal question, and I'm not going to answer it. I think I think Lewis is has no contract, and I think there is some, there's something more going on there that's a bit suspicious. Uh, well, I think that... Uh... Falling out of love is a very harsh statement for Lewis right now. We know Shakira probably broke his heart. Uh, you know, we don't want to def- necessarily mix those metaphors. Uh, and I think this is actually a galaxy brain move by Lewis here. He knows that historically when drivers sign con- new contracts, new big deals, uh, their next race is garbage. So, you know, if we do it at the first week of the summer break, we get all this time before Zanvoort. All the garbage racing voodoo is gone and thus he can race well at Zanvoort. I will subscribe to that theory. In all honesty, I could absolutely believe that because he does seem to be a bit more chipper recently. Um, so yeah, I can buy that. I can buy that. Uh, in in uh, in the world of tire news, uh, Pirelli is confirmed, I believe, through twenty twenty seven to be the tire supplier for Formula One. Despite information coming out that Bridgestone put out more money for the job than Pirelli did. 
I thought they had come out and said it had not been formally decided yet, and whoever had that information was telling Porky Pies. But maybe I misremembered that. I, I feel it's pretty much a foregone conclusion. I, I agree with it, but at the same time. Um, and I do have a follow-up question. You say they offered more money. Is that to say that Bridgestone offered it for less money, meaning it will cost F1 and the teams less money for the tyres, and therefore it costs Bridgestone more money? Or is there some kind of weird funny money going on i'm not entirely sure but the the headlines i read seem to indicate that f1 left money on the table by interesting by by not going with pirelli well because there has to be some there has to be some monetary compensation because like pirelli is branded everywhere all over the circuits and stuff so i imagine liberty might get some kickback of like we are an f1 sponsor and then it depends how much they pay the charge of the teams and stuff yeah, I assume it nets out like you get the discount. Like, the question is, is whether somebody from Liberty Media writes a check for the tyres and then Pirelli writes a smaller check back for the sponsorship or whether it's all just nets out and somebody exchanges a token $1 or whatever it ends up being in reality. That's a CEO level salary right there. Exactly, because uh, you get all the other shit on the side. Uh, I think the other aspect here is I wonder if actually F1 has probably done a backroom deal and maybe Bridgestone's coming in for 2026. Like we're changing the car, we're making it smaller, shorter, uh, narrower lighter new engine with all kinds of stuff that everybody's upset about and that would be an appropriate time to come in and and change up the tires i think it would be really interesting to have some sort of tire war again i think we need something to help delineate the cars i agree absolutely agree okay next item uh charles wants to stay at ferrari forever yeah there was uh something that came i think it was in one of the um the it's not really between the races but it was definitely inside the uh one of the pens um I think after his qualifying or something, but he was asked about his future with Ferrari. Uh, and I have always been a person that with my heart more than reason. I love Ferrari. The goal of Ferrari is to be a world champion and bring Ferrari back to the top. Oh, Charles. This is, this is, this is ridiculous. I understand there is an aspiration. Like to win a championship in a Ferrari is probably the greatest championship any driver could ever hope to win. I mean, especially these days, it's a tractor. Exactly. And, and on top of that, like, the achievement, like, it's not just that you've won a world championship. you won a world championship in a Ferrari against everything. The headwinds, the team, the country was all against you, and yet you prevailed. It makes you the greatest driver of all time. But yet he seems to be completely delusional. I mean, the last person to win a world championship in a Ferrari was a hobbyist driver. Indeed, which is, just makes it, shows how he is, in fact, better than all of the other greats. And just for the people who who don't know, we're talking about Kimi Raikkonen. I wonder how much of this is... Um... Charles is bought into the new Ferrari boss. Maybe we will see some changes during the off season. Maybe Javi will no longer have a job and maybe they'll let Ferrari do for, maybe they'll let them actually make the team good. The only way that happens is a three to five year journey, right? Like I think Ferrari, to be brutally honest, they might be able to produce a car, but they will not be able to convert that a good car into successfully winning without fixing the rest of the team. And that is a, three to five year journey and i do not understand how any ferrari team principal can survive that i and therefore i feel it's unattainable for someone to spend three years faffing around not being able to do it i, I did it it feels like that's what should be possible and that's what schumacher and ross braun and john top were able to do was to get that five year window where they were able to convert after three to start being successful i don't understand how that happens and i'm i'm to be brutally honest i'm not sure that charles is the person either to do that in general or be his ability to just constantly outdrive the car and put it in a wall. You know, the interesting thing in all this is, like, if you look back at the history of Ferrari, like, uh, we look back over, like, the last, what, since Ross Braun and Schumacher left Ferrari, almost 20 years, and there's a lot of mediocrity there, and in some sense it seems like people are being kept in jobs they should not have. Um, and you think back in furry, further Ferrari history, and there is no way old man Enzo would have ever allowed for any of that. They are not living the, the true Ferrari ethos. Yeah. The the true Ferrari ethos needs to be, this car will be a winner or I'll break your kneecaps. You know, it's actually really interesting to think about that and the realities of Ferrari. I think you've, you've hit upon a really interesting point. Ferrari has this reputation for being quick to judge and quick to fire. Except that this doesn't apply to the people that really matter. It only applies to the figureheads. And it only really applies to the drivers. They don't change the rest of the team. And I'm sure there are lots of really, really good people at Ferrari. But there are clearly people there who have the culture wrong. And it's the culture. It's not the people in themselves. It's not their intrinsic abstract skill sets. It's the fact that they culture just screws with so much. Like, we see it all the time in various different jobs I've had. Culture, you know, culture eats strategy for breakfast. And that is really the problem for Ferrari. 
That's the test of Mercedes. That's the real test. Can Mercedes leverage what everybody, what they say is their culture to turn it into success? And we'll find out in the next three years. Yeah, I think that's that's something that like Red Bull definitely had to endure during the last period of Mercedes dominance. I think they did a really good job with it because they they kept their heads up. They kept grinding. They made some bold moves when it came to like moving to the Honda engine and they got it done. Exactly. Co-signed as much as I'm not a Red Bull fan. Co-signed. Uh, okay, should we talk about the next item or should we go to the next section and talk about that in the next section? Well, it's a fantastic segue, so we should just do both. Okay, we're going to go into the occasional segment of Does Blank Still Have a Job? Opening with the between-race drama of they fired the whole Alpine team. I exaggerate, but they basically fired the whole Alpine team. Yeah, I saw the meme going around of uh, Gasly and Alcon are going to be doing their own uh, wheel changes at the pit stops. Uh, I would not shock me if that actually came to be. I would, like, I'd be surprised, but I wouldn't be shocked. Hey, that's that's very beneficial for the cost cap. It is. It saves a lot of money because those, drive, those um, pit crew cost money. Um, but you still got to pay them to drive around the truck, so who knows. Uh, the thing that I think that's really curious about this is putting aside uh, the fact that Otmar did a great interview, actually, in the F1 Off The Grid podcast this week. It was actually really interesting. It was an hour of him talking about his experiences and the challenges of Alpine. Um, I, from someone who didn't think was particularly good at their job, he actually was spoke very eloquently and was very clear-minded about what needed to happen. Um, I'm convinced that at least 40% of the reason they fired everybody is they weren't French and that Renault and Alpine want to have a French team succeed with French management. They've got two drivers, they've got a French engine, and now they just need a French leadership team, and it will achieve the greatest success in Formula 1 that they've ever hoped for. Well, Dominic, you're watching uh, Tour de France Unchained. Uh, how do you think f- pure French leadership is going to go on the Formula 1 grid? Anything like the Tour de France uh, grid? It's, it's going it's to be amazing for the rest of us, because we'll have something to talk about. <laughs> Did did you see Alain Prost was extremely critical of Laurent Rossi uh, this week as well, uh, throwing him under the bus, saying that he doesn't know how to run a team, which I thought was brilliant. Wait, isn't that the same person who threw Otmar under the bus for not being able to run a t- run a team? I think so. Yeah, okay. Uh, I, I would like to see Alain Prost come back. I, you know, I would love to see Alain Prost come out of retirement to be an actual team principal at uh, uh, Renault slash Alpine. I think that would be great. Oh, that would definitely give us some drama. I think that would be brilliant. I think I think he has value to add, and it would be interesting and exciting. Let's not forget the time he purposely ran the car underweight when he was running a team to, to try to attract a sponsor. He did? Yeah. Everybody says he's such a nice person, but apparently he's a bit of a cheater. So uh, you remember, like, there was, like, Prost GP in, like, the 90s, right? Yes, 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 so yes, yes. there was one year where they knew the car was absolute shit. They went to testing, and because it's testing and nobody cares, they deliberately ran the car massively underweight so it looked like a damn rocket ship so they could try to get some sponsorship in. That is extremely sneaky. Uh, re- referring back to the F1 Off The Grid podcast again, uh, he did a really, uh, Alan Prost did a really interesting, I think, two interviews maybe in the last two years with that podcast. Definitely worth a listen because he talks about his time running at Prost GP and how basically all the sponsors screwed him and... Eddie Jordan screwed him and somebody else screwed him. And then he also talks about the experiences that he had with Ayrton Senna and how they hated each other until about six months before Ayrton Senna uh, had a whoopsie. Yeah, uh, I, I do think it'd be interesting to see prospect. That would be interesting. I'm not sure as a team principal, though. Maybe as like the Nicky Loudon Mercedes role. Maybe, because he was trying to play that role, but it, they didn't want him. And they, apparently he had a falling out with Lauren Rossi last year, and that's why he left. Uh, apparently the rumor name I heard was uh, Benotto to come in for Alpine. Oh, yeah, I could see that. He's not French, though. He's not French, but maybe they'll give an exception because it's close enough to France. It shares a border with France, so it's okay. Oh, ex Ferrari, that might be the Alpha Tauri spot. Oh, well, we can talk about that at the end. That's your crazy. Oh, no, 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 no. never mind. I'll come back to that later. Uh, do we have any more to add on the Alpine slash Otmar situation? Uh, no, I don't think so. I was just wondering if there's anything else from between the races that happened. I don't think so. Okay. Uh, Lance, does Lance still have a job? I didn't think it was a great drive. Uh, to... No. It was not a great drive. I, I mean, how many different ways can we say no? Let's see. He was in the sprint. He was 11th in the race. He was 9th. He got two points. He got in the points. Good job after sliding back. Yeah. There there was a gra- graphic of, like, uh, the leader on the team versus, like, what percentage of the Constructor Championship points do they have, and Fernando Alonso, like, far and away has all of Aston's points. <laughs> 
just so terrible. It's so terrible. Uh, which which leads us to the interesting rumour that was doing the rounds, uh, which was that Peroni will no longer be sponsoring um, Aston Martin and then will, in fact, be sponsoring Ferrari, um, who is also currently sponsored by a beer company, who will no longer be sponsored by a beer company. And that beer company went to sponsor Ferrari, a name I've forgotten, uh, because they are Sainz's, uh, like, you know, buddy sponsor. Which leads to an interesting question. Who are they going to sponsor? Is it going to be Aston Martin? And where is Carlos Sainz going? Are they going for an all-Spanish team? Uh, I mean, th- this could lead to one of the theories that we floated a little bit ago was Stroll to Ferrari, signs to Aston Martin. Exactly. This is clearly evidence that this is going to happen. And Charles was in the news this week talking about how much he loves Carlos as his teammate. So he, that might be also some messaging to management of no don't let carlos go to aston martin don't pair me with lance because he doesn't want to be crushed by lance actually honestly if if charles wants to win a world championship with ferrari he needs lance as his second driver because he won't try and compete with him or can't compete with him yes because looking back to last year's f1 season um carl or uh, charles was in a rocket ship of a ferrari and carlos could not drive that car they equalized the car to help Carlos be more on pace with Charles, and it nuked Charles's pace. So if you put somebody like Lance in, where there's no hope of ever getting him on pace, then we can develop the car for Charles. Charles has a rocket ship. That's how he wins. Uh, insert, what was it, uh, Always Sunny in Philadelphia uh, gif of Guy wrapping all the connections between to make it just so. Uh, I think that one that, that, that one's plausible, but also a bit tenuous. Oh, I thought we, were, we would do like the title card of uh, Lance, how Lance wins the world championship. That should be an excellent presentation that we will do at the very end of this season uh, after we know where things are happening and we can provide a concrete plan forward. It will be it could be our first video episode. We'll put it on YouTube. Whoa. Uh, next next on the list is Ferrari. Do we want to talk about Ferrari or we just we've, we've kind of Ferrari to death already? I mean, yeah. How much more can you say? They about didn't Ferrari? have a, they didn't have a terrible race. Charles didn't have a terrible race. No, but it wasn't. Ferrari, the team, did not screw up. Uh, yeah, they could have called Charles in for inters. I guess. I guess that yeah, that would not have been that would that would not have been a completely unexpected solution for Ferrari. Okay, uh, they didn't totally botch it. They they still went from first to third though. Yeah, I mean, I will give the I will give Leclerc the fact that the reality was he's not going to beat the Red Bulls. Uh, anyway, next, Logan Sargent. I don't think we've got anything to say about him. We drive around at the back. I'm still not sure whether he should be an F1 or not. It's getting pretty close, though. Uh, Perez, I think he's safe through 2023. It came out, um, uh, Helmut Marko was asked pretty much the direct question of, can you swap him to the Alpha Tauri? And apparently he has a line in his contract that says he cannot get swapped to the Alpha Tauri, which, great job, contract writers of Formula One. Uh, you know who the Red Bull team are, and you put that in the contract. Great job. Fantastic. Excellent. Um, and I think that means like we won't see Ricardo swapped in or swapped into the Red Bull seat uh, or Yuki for that matter because Yuki's also driving very well. Just because like at that point, who do you put back in the Alpha Tower? You can't put Nick uh, Nick Debris back in. Like no, God no, no, you can't do that. Uh, you can't like you're going to grab Liam from Super Formula for like five races. So and apparently he's doing well in Super Formula. Like he's on target to be successful. Yeah. So like the I think the more realistic solution is like. You know, somebody, if Perez gets punted out of the Red Bull seat, it happens after 2023. You move maybe either Yuki or Daniel up, probably Daniel. Um, and then you move Liam into partner with Luke, uh, with Yuki. So are we, are we making a suggestion? I think I support that we take Perez off the list. I think so. Okay, we will take him off the list. That is, uh, we've got one, two people got fired, Otmar and Nick DeBreeze. Uh, off the list and now we're taking Perez off the list oh we had one other week Zach Brown is also off the list although maybe after this week's performance I'm not so sure maybe he needs to come back but I have thoughts on McLaren I think McLaren had a fine weekend I think they did I think they were just unlucky they also had a massive rear wing and I don't know why they picked it I have theories we'll talk about that in the race shall we Uh, last on the occasional segment to still have a job it's going to be really quick Yuki yes Ricardo was made to look bad by Yuki uh yeah i have some thoughts on that in the race uh i don't think that's totally ricardo's fault but i think yuki is always much better than people give him credit for despite being what his dream wanted to be a restaurateur and not a formula one champion well, it's like lewis he wants to be a, a musician slash rock star he, he but he's great in formula one yeah but he also wants that eighth championship really bad true true 
However, I think that's what helps make Yuhi a really great driver because he's not overwhelmed by the burden of a championship. You saw what happened to Perez. Yuki's just out. Yuki is the next generation. Yuki is the Japanese Kimi. I can believe that. Ad- adored by all. Great quotes. Swearing. Goes out there. It- it's a hobby to him. Y- Yuki is is our new Kimi. Yuki Raikkonen. Yes. Great. Uh, okay. Quality recap. Uh, I mean, it was it was interesting. Um. Uh, only because it was a drying track again, which is, what, the third race in a row now that we've had this? Because I think it was at Silverstone, and then it happened at Hungary, and now it's happened here. It, it's fun, but I... It happened here twice, if you include the sprint race. True. I, that is very true. Um, yeah, it was a bit of a non-event. Uh, the only thing I took away from it is Lewis had a conversation with his engineer about his mirrors. And Lewis says, can someone come fix my mirrors? At which point, an engineer runs diligently down the pit lane and hands him some new gloves. And then leaves and doesn't fix his mirrors. See, Dominic, what you're missing here is this is clearly code between Lewis and Bono. Throughout their whole life, they've just been speaking in code on the radio. And fix my mirrors really just means I need a new pair of gloves. But it's, it, it, it makes sense to have code. I understand why you have code to throw the team off. But mirrors for gloves? Like, is that like on page 94 of the secret decoder manual? It's very strange. Uh, but that was the, probably the interesting, not exciting, but interesting part of qualifying. Uh, Max was quite livid at the end of Q2 because he barely made it through. Uh, yeah, and then, uh, yeah, I don't entirely know what happened there. I just got some of the radio messages, or I saw some of the radio messages between GP and Max of like, well, you're the one that wanted to charge the battery or something like that. Yeah, Max was really covering for the fact he went off. He had a, basically a really tight moment at uh, the corner with no name uh, and nearly went off into the wall, and that's really what screwed that last lap that he was trying for. Uh, and so I think it was his own fault. He can blame the team as much as he wants, but it was his own fault. Shouldn't have put it. Shouldn't shouldn't have screwed up. But then he put it on pole by eight tenths. So you know. <laughs> uh, well, exactly. It's it. He had it. He just was. He just, he just screwed up that one time. I uh, I very much enjoyed the uh, the Max versus GP radio messages this week. Uh, I fully believe they are on the same team and absolutely trust each other. But man, there were some good radio messages this week. It was definitely a bit feisty. Yeah, let's talk about the sprint. Uh, it got shortened, didn't it? Only 11 laps? It did because of the rain and they were driving around in a circle for behind the safety car for four laps or three laps, I think it was. Yeah, five more laps would have made that race epic because it it had ju- it pretty much reached the crossover point like a lap and a half to go, two laps to go. Yeah. And yeah. So, so five more laps, that would have been one epic race. They always say that they can't extend the races because of the fuel load, which I understand. It makes sense. But if there was ever an argument to allow refueling again, it would be that. I feel like there's an excuse to make this happen. If you're doing a sprint race, it, you only need like, you, or you don't need the whole full hundred kilograms. So you could add five laps if you really wanted to. But that's that's a little bit, in my opinion, of like putting your finger on the scale of like, oh no, it's another lap. Like, well, what they should do, and well, there's two things they could do. They could do the slightly weird thing that um, the lower formulas do which is that it's a timed thing, and they time it, and then when you do it, get to the very end and the clock runs out, you get one more lap. They could try solving it a little bit that way. The other thing that they could try doing is they could just legally require people to be fueled an extra 15% for for an extra five laps or something, and that's what it is, and then, uh, and you would only enforce that rule in the case of a wet race. I don't know, it just seems maybe, maybe it's worth it, but yes. Uh, Time plus three laps could be interesting. Indeed, I agree with that. Uh, Perez and Lewis coming together. They did. Lewis, Lewis, uh, Lewis got a super harsh penalty for what I think was a bit of a wet track racing incident because he also got two penalty points on his license. Oh, he did too. It was a proper one, was it? That sucks. Uh, I, I thought this was interesting in for two ways. One, I, I do agree it was a racing incident, especially as you look at it and it's like, whoops, it's gone sideways. Um, the second part that I think that is kind of weird and interesting is I almost wonder if. Uh, Red Bull intentionally forced Perez to retire to make it look bad so that Lewis would get hurt because they don't like Lewis. Yeah, I think it's also one of those, the points only go eight deep, and once you're out of the points, like, what's... And you're clearly going backwards, why bother? Keep going. Save the engine. Um, you know, not not to jump too far to, like, the race, but Crofty and Brundle were talking about that with Carlos Sainz as well, of, like, you are clearly going backwards. You're not going to finish in the points. Save the engine. And it was interesting because Perez was already going backwards. He was already in trouble. 
before Lewis got on him. And so I think there's also something else going on there. If it hadn't been a safety car start, if it had been a, a grid start, we would have probably got a repeat of the uh, the hungry situation last year with Lewis being the sole driver on the grid. Yeah, I think so. I'd agree with that. It was definitely close. There were a lot of people that dove in as soon as the safety car was done. And uh, yeah, Max did one lap on the wets and then came in and then he was, what, three seconds behind Oscar? Uh, Alonso bends it. He did. He doesn't usually bend it and he bend it. It was it was very rare, and I think I think you can use that to make an excuse for some of the other drivers who maybe had some whoopsies. Um, that you know, if Alonso bins it, uh, and he was he looked like a really unlucky binning it too. He was not pushing; he was just being tentative. Um, but sucks for him, especially on his birthday weekend. First uh, first time all year he hasn't scored points in a point scoring ability. Oh, interesting, interesting. Well, it shows that shows how a good season it's gone for him in general, other than the car going backwards. Which sidebar, Aston Martin admitted that they've screwed up the car. They said they don't quite understand why, but it has definitely gone backwards due to due to an upgrade. Uh, do you think? Um, so, I assume you are familiar with custom Slack emojis and stuff uh, and gifts. Do you think if there is a uh, Aston Martin Formula One team uh, Slack? that they have a uh, Lawrence Stroll, uh, I'm very angry for a uh, GIF or custom me or custom emoji already set up for something like this. I would, I hope they do. And I hope they've got Alonzo ones where Alonzo is like, you know, looking smug because that's what he does. And then I hope they've got a crying Lance one for whenever Lance screws up. Uh, they also need the, uh, for Lonzo, uh, Alonzo on the, uh, on the camping chair at Brazil. Yes, exactly. Which was very similar to this. You'd use that in this situation today. You'd react with Lawrence, and then you'd react with Camping Chair. Race recap? Yeah, let's get to it. Um, I thought it was, the first half I thought was pretty interesting, and then the rain stopped. There was no rain in the race today. Oh no, wait, there was a little bit. That wasn't rain. There was no rain. No rain happened today. People put on ponchos. There were team principals holding their hands out in the pit lane. Doesn't mean it rained. And there was rain on the camera, but there wasn't rain in that race. I don't think it did anything to the race. Max went slightly sideways, and that's going to drop his uh, his driver ranking from like a 9.5 to a 9.0, because he clearly can't control the car going up Radeon. Oh, more than that. N- down to a 2, because can't keep it in a straight line. Um, yeah, I, my, my summary really was, well, there was a race, and it was all right, and it went around for two hours. Um, I will say I enjoy Spa every time. It's always a good race, even when it's a boring race. It's still a good race. It's a fun track. It's got all the fun bits. Uh, if only they could... It's a beautiful track. It is beautiful. And I just wish they had slightly less death corner on it. Um, and I think they can fix that without losing the spirit of the corner. I agree. Or just 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 put a ramp and make it a proper jump and really just like, you know, hot wheels this thing. Exactly. And then that would enable people to have to push their suspension to even greater heights. Literally. Um... So one thing I noticed while watching the race, um, there was a point where Perez was in front and leading and Max was trying to catch him. And uh, he was getting real close. And then there was this radio message just immediately before Perez pits that was Max asking, says, so are we going to do it? And then GP was just like, use your head, use your head. And I want to know what the are we going to do it was. I would also like to point out, as a very important fact, whenever Perez is this far in front of uh, Max and he pits, his pit stop always gets screwed up. Yeah, there were sparks flying off. I was hopeful that they. Uh, I was. I was. I was very happy the second time they did press a second stop. They were actually get to, able to get the tire off, and it didn't in turn. In, uh, they didn't try to go for uh, Valtteri Bottas's uh, pit stop record. <laughs> Four weeks, three months, and six days. Uh, <laughs> exactly. Forty-eight hours. Be kind. Okay, I'm sorry. I over exaggerated. Yeah. Um. Yeah, that was that was interesting. Um, I just assumed that was something about like tire strategy. You wanted to make sure they were on equal footing, something like that. Uh, however, did uh, there was a great onboard with Max, like right after the pit stop cycle, where he was within three tenths of Perez for pretty much the entire lap, and it was amazing to watch because Max was like just nailing every apex, driving the car like through the corners amazingly well. And Perez was just, like, all over the place, <laughs> comparatively. Almost, all the drivers were all over the place. If you were watching all weekend, anywhere there was a moment of possible slippiness, Max was, apart from the wobble he had into the corner of No Name and on Eau Rouge in the race, uh, was very solid almost the entire time. And everybody else was a bit, not fighty, but definitely not quite as stable. 
And I think that's the thing that's setting him apart, both from the rest of the field, but more importantly from Perez. Um, but like yes. you, you watch some of the other splits and you'd see like, oh, they're going down the Kemmel straight and like they close up a little bit because of the slip streams. And then, you know, when you go through like Puan and no name, you see things start to spread out a little bit. And, but with like that lap followed with Max falling Perez, he was just three tenths the entire lap. It was impressive. Do you think Max is partially being so close and staying intentionally that tight just to show Perez about the fact that it's Max's team and how dare you be just a jackass about everything? Uh, I don't think Max is that vindictive. I think it's definitely a I'm better than you. Because uh, like, it took Max a little bit more time than I would have thought to clear um, Hamilton and Charles. And Perez could not open up a gap in that time. So I was thinking about that at the time as uh, Max was trying to go past uh, Lewis. And I think there's two things that played into it. One, Max is finally driving like a champion, which is to say, I don't actually need to get past and make a point. I'm just going to take my time, get real close and make this work. Two, the previous day, Lewis had gone bang into his teammate and taken him out. And so maybe Max was trying to be a bit more cautious. Oh, yeah, I definitely think it was. I have 44 laps to do this. I am I don't need to rush through it. But I think it was very like, you know, if Max is in front, you know, we've seen him open up gaps in the first five, ten laps to, to really start to pull away. And, and, you know, maybe then he goes into like a tire management mode. And Perez had three seconds on Charles and that was it. And that's and that was pretty much his gap to Charles. The entire race was between three and six seconds. Like he was never able to like really open up the gap. And, you know, if if you're trying to beat Max and you've got cars between, you got bodies between you and Max, you better pull out a gap for every shot. Like you saw, like George had great pace towards the end of the race, but he had spent so much time in traffic. He was 30 seconds behind. It, it, it made me think about the fact that, you know, we talk about drivers who overdrive a car. I think the reality is Max has been given an amazing car that he is then out driving that car. Like he's going more than that car can do. But I think Perez is underdriving that car. He is not reaching the full capabilities of that car. I'm not expecting him to be up there with Max. Perez is, whether he believes he is or not, and anybody else who's a fan, which should be, is an idiot for saying this, he's not Max. But I feel like he should be better or making more advantage is maybe the correct way of saying it in that car. That car is clearly a comical rocket ship. It is ridiculous. Um, but he's just not, he's not able to extract it. And I don't think it's a difficult car to drive. It doesn't look like a difficulty, what was the Mercedes term? It's not a diva, that car, right? It's a car, you get in it and drive it. Hey, I'd put it into a wall, I'm sure. I'm pretty sure I'd put it into the wall at the first corner before I got it out of the garage. I'd be str- I'd be doing a Max at Silverstone. Yeah, then you'd be just as good as Max of running into the curb out of the pit lane. Um, yeah, no, I, I was watching the, the race with a friend and... We were we were just laughing of like every lap there goes another like two tenths out of Perez like every, every single lap and there was at one point in time where they were talking about some of the pace of the cars and it's like everybody's in the one fifty twos except for Max who's in the one fifty ones don't well he's on his own like level <laughs> yeah, let's not bench set against Max it's not helpful it's not productive next uh Ricard- Ricardo yeah what happened to his pace he was great in the sprint he seemed to be like like you're like this is the Ricardo we know and love. And then it was terrible today compared to Yuki, especially when you compare it to Yuki. Uh, so early in the race, he was stuck in like the forever long DRS train that went from like signs all the way back. Uh, they tried to pit him and pit him and get him in some clear. And I really think the Alpha Tauri is just terrible in traffic because I think that's the one difference of Danny was always following somebody about like 0.7 to a second back in like the DRS zone. And that car just doesn't have enough pace to get around somebody in traffic. And Yuki was in pretty clear air most of the time. But what about yesterday, where Ricardo was overtaking people and doing great? Was it just a byproduct of the fact that in yesterday's race it was a drying track, which is the great equalizer? I think it was it was a bit of a great equalizer, variable variable conditions, where Daniel could show his true pace. Um, yeah, and kind of segueing into McLaren's weekend a little bit, there's a possibility of maybe they set up the car more for the rain than for the dry. Because if you are a backmarker team, gamble on the rain. And on the drying track, on the wet track, Ricardo had pace. And then if you are not, uh, if you're not slippery and you're draggy because of the rain, you don't have the straight line speed to come, I, to come around the Hasses. And I think this week, oh, this weekend was a very mixed up grid in the term of who was banking on the wet and who was banking on the dry. Um, Red Bull, Ferrari, Aston Martin, they all set up their cars to be, to hope for a dry Sunday. 
uh, and they were going to take the pain everywhere else. And then McLaren clearly set up their car for the wet because uh, like Lando was floundering at the back of the field, uh, like 17th, 18th. And then that light rain started to fall. And the next thing you know, he's up to like seventh and holds it there. But it, that's the key. That's the thing I don't quite understand. And I have to assume it has a big chunk to do with fuel load. Sure, he was languishing at the back and then it rained and he was able, the car was working better because it had more downforce because of the massive rear wing. But then he was able to stay in seventh and he wasn't in trouble in seventh. He wasn't playing defensive and he was able to maintain that relatively easily. Um, the, the, the commentary said that he had a busted steering for a lot of the race and then they finally fixed it. And maybe that's really what was causing him to be stuck at the back, not the giant wing of doom that I thought it was. But it definitely it definitely helps. Like It moved him forward. It all helped, yeah, because that was where he made up a lot of places. Was when he when he jumped when he just went forward uh, when the rain started to come down, and he made up like three or four places real quick with the down wing, with the big wing. Okay, should we talk about Merck next. Oh, I guess um, seems consistent. Cars doing the right thing. Do you, do you think they've made a leap forward? Would you would you push back on me and say that the car has been fixed? It's tough to say because like Red Bull is clearly the class of the field. Aston have clearly screwed something up and Ferrari are so like in the middle of everything that it's kind of hard to place. The thing, the thing, the thing that I take away from it is I still think the car is crap. I don't think anybody would dispute that, but I think whatever has happened to Lewis since his breakup with Shakira, it has emotionally moved him to now be better than George. Like that is the biggest shift. I think you can make a judgment and trying to work out what's happened is Lewis is in front of George consistently, right? Like, for the previous year, there was no way that, like, Lewis would dig deep and get in front of him in qualifying, and in the race, he always seemed to just languish. But something happened since they got those upgrades, and maybe it genuinely is that, you know, George spent the last three years driving around in a tractor, and he's just used to dealing with a crap car. Lewis is not used to dealing with a crap car. Now the car is balanced, at least. It might not have the performance, but now he can do it. I, I think there's, there's something interesting going on there that I can't, I don't really quite understand. Um, uh, Sites versus uh, Piastri. Yeah, the turn one collision. Uh, I don't think Sites left Oscar enough space. I think he's lucky to escape without without a penalty. Um, I think I think I agree. Except Piastri, really, he was trying too hard. Uh, yeah, but it's it's the source. Um, like the, that was my major concern for like Max in, uh, P6, who, by the way, gets a win from a new grid position. So Max's side quests are going very well. He needs to do the side quest of every position on the grid in one season. I mean, I think once, once he has it wrapped up, I think he should try for a pit lane start to, uh, to win. I agree. Has anybody ever done that? Or just, just like start pulling out the record book of where has nobody ever won. And it's like, can I somehow qualify like P17 just to go like P17 to P1? He needs to do that. It's worth it. Uh, but yeah, pastry should not have been going down the inside. And yes, I too shake said pastry? concern that pastry did I? Oh God, did I do that? I'm sorry. Yes, I'm sorry, Oscar. Uh, but piastri going down the inside. He was he was hope it was an open prayer. Uh, but I'm glad Max didn't get whacked because that would have just been annoying. Yeah, no, I was watching Max on the start, and he went so far around the outside at La Source. He's like. Uh, this is the one spot where I could have a problem. I'm just going to take it very wide. Oh, yay, they touched. I'm up to P4. Huzzah. Smart boy. Uh, last item, Red Bull breaks the trophy. Well, not last item. I've got one to pull up from the middle. But Red Bull breaks the trophy again. I didn't see the picture of the broken trophy, but I did see that they broke it again. Yeah, they uh, they, uh, they were they were doing the big team photo afterwards, and then they were like trying to run away from champagne or something like that. And whoever was holding up the, the pit board of like Max P1, Sergio P2, like the pit board knocked into the trophy, and the trophy fell over, and the trophy broke. So uh, trophy broke again. Max looked pretty shocked about it. He looked actually quite upset about it. It's like, oh crap, what have I done? So well, I it, it's his first of the his home weekend doubleheader. True, it is a truly important trophy for him being from his home. I, I do feel um, bad about that hungry trophy though. That trophy was beautiful. It was alright. It's a trophy. I think it's I, it's better than some of like the random globs of metal we see. I th- I agree with that. I also feel like it was better than the Monaco trophy, which just seems like they just want to do weird stuff with the trophy with a case and the whole stuff. I'm like, it doesn't make sense. Yeah, I, I really like um, the thing I really liked about the Hungary trophy was similar to how we've talked with uh, when they go to Mexico and they do the mariachi band Formula One theme. Uh, I I love the uh, the local cultural takes on like Formula One trophies, Formula One themes, and I would love to see more of that because I think it really makes it feel like a world championship. Indeed, it makes it feel like you the team that the, the 
the race has come to you and is partaking in your culture rather than you just being a happy stop along the way. Exactly. Okay. Last thing from the race, though. Uh, towards the end, Max said, uh, well, I could go uh, hard, drive harder and then pit. And I think this was because Max was bored. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And I think he wanted to play out this scenario because the, the supposition was he'd drive harder and then pit. My suggestion is actually what he was asking was, I want to pit right now. I will end up in P5 behind Hamilton. Yeah, no, P4 behind Hamilton, five seconds behind him, 10 seconds behind Leclerc, and then about 15 seconds behind Perez. And then he will side through the field and win by five seconds, having fun, right? And on top of that, there was no risk to him. There is zero risk, right? He might bend the car. Maybe the cost cap's a concern for Red Bull because they spent too much on catering again. But even if he had crashed, even if it had gone wrong, it was in no danger for any... There was no jeopardy involved in those situations. And I don't know why they didn't do it. That was the between race drama I was missing. Was the uh, no? It's Helmut Marco. That's the cost cap problem. I remember you texting me this. Yes. We'll, we'll talk about that in takes and rumors. We'll, we'll yeah. We'll, we'll put a put a put quick pin in that because that's going to get interesting how that shakes out. Um, I think that that's it for the race. I think. Yeah. No. I just going to say. Um, I, I think while they haven't clinched anything, uh, they are going to uh, still keep it relatively safe but i think as soon as they clinch the drivers i i would love for them to try to have some fun with with some of this uh, yes they need to, they need to for the sake of formula one uh that being said however uh i think it would be great if they just clean sweep the season and just like put that record on a shelf of oh yeah you want to talk about like oh well we won more race or more percentage than mclaren but McL- or, or we didn't win as many as mclaren but mclaren has a higher percentage but there were only 16 races no nah, man go 23 of 23 or 24 of 24 however many races are in the season 23 i think go 23 of 23 100 win record put that record on a shelf that can only be tied never broken so the thing that's going to be interesting about that is when it happens, Ferrari will eventually, because they believe they will be the greatest team of all time, will push for more races despite the fact I don't think they're particularly jazzed about it, if only to be able to say that they got the new record. Well, 2024 has 24 races. So there we go, Ferrari. Like, you could take it from Red Bull at that point in time. Yeah. I can't wait till 2052 and we have a race every weekend. Yay. I'm not excited about that. Okay, spicy takes and rumors. Uh, I'm going to open with this one. This isn't really a spicy take slash rumor, but I feel like this is the best place to put it. We haven't heard about Max's cats in a while. He has cats and he likes them. They're some Bengals, but we haven't heard about them all. If you have any tips or rumors or information from when you've been hanging out in Monaco, dear listener, let us know what's going on with Max's cats, because I really want to know. We heard some about them in uh, Hungary. Did we? Yeah, uh, during the uh, Ricardo Max press conference or something, uh, they're apparently, or it was Silverstone maybe, uh, where Checo and Ricardo were talking about Max's cats, and apparently one got lost but was found. Interesting. If you have any more details on this, please send it into feedback at tinfoilhelmets.com. If you have seen a cat of Max's. Or any cat. I will take any cat picture. Uh, yeah. Um, so one thing we didn't talk about in Between Race Drama that like I think we can definitely throw in takes and rumors is... Uh, it seems like Red Bull might have gone over the cost cap, but in a very interesting way because Christian Horner has come out and said like they stopped developing the car. Um, yeah, they stopped developing the car, so like they're way under on the 2022 budget. However, the FIA is very upset that Helmut Marco is not listed as one of like the top exempt salaries at Red Bull, and thus he is not exempt from like cost cap spending. And Red Bull's counter argument is he is not a Red Bull employee. So it's, or a Red Bull racing employee, because I believe he is actually under contract from like the Red Bull energy company. Oh, I see. Uh, I was about to say, mate, he's getting paid zero dollars by Red Bull racing. So the kind of the argument is like he is managing all the drivers and thus he should be part of like Red Bull Racing. But then like at the same point in time, can he be split like across with Alpha Tauri? Because I guess he's also managing them. Um, but in reality, he because he did say he had a contract with Red Bull. He did not specify if that was Red Bull Racing or Red Bull, the energy drink company. Uh, I think it's very likely his contract is with the Red Bull Energy Drink Company of you are managing our motorsports drivers because, you know, not only is that Formula One, there's Formula Two, Super Formula, Formula Three, Formula Four, the whole junior program. So I, it's going to be interesting to see how that all plays out because there are other teams that are making the argument like, well, he's in the Red Bull garage every single weekend. You have a guest in your garage every single weekend or at some point are you an employee? And I think that's going to get really interesting from like a contract law uh rules lawyering situation 
So here's how this is going to go down. There is going to be a preliminary discussion about the fact that Red Bull has broken the um, cost cap by however much they pay Helmut Marko. And then there will be a backroom deal between Alpine, Williams, Haas, and there's another team in the... No, wait. Then one of the team who's talked about this, I can't remember who it is, because they all have capital expenditure problems and they want to raise the the cap X on the budget cap from the thirty six million to something else every however how often, and they need five teams. And apparently, there's, there's the fifth team is being a pain in the ass. Here's what the deal is going to be: they're going to agree to like have some conversation and adjudicate Marco as being okay for this season. With if if Red Bull will provide the fifth vote to increase the cap X budget cap well i i think we've talked about on this podcast before i think like uh as part of like when uh wind tunnel time cfd cfd computations like i would put infrastructure projects on that same thing as well as if you are the last team you can spend more on an infrastructure project than like a top team because like a bigger wind tunnel or a better wind tunnel or a better supercomputer or something to help you do all the cfd programs i think that's that's as critical as important so i would i i would be the fifth team vote but like i don't own a formula one team not yet still time I got to I got to get a I got to join a better startup company with a more lucrative stock plan. Indeed. What you need to do is find a startup that chooses to buy an F1 team and then you can segue into working on the F1 team. Uh no, I want the startup to make money. Okay, you don't want to be part of the F- you're not going to just take it for living in the F1 life. Uh, you have to cancel the podcast at that point because then you'd be part of a team and you can't really be on the podcast at that point. That's fair. Yeah, see I I wouldn't do that to our dozen listeners. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, there was one more point I was going to make about cost cap. Something. Oh, that's it. Alpine, it came out this week and fully admitted that their engine is a dumpster fire. Specifically, the battery is not good and therefore they would like the FIA to enforce uh, engine equalization, um, which just strikes me as just in the same way they said, oh, you can fix your reliability problems um, to improve performance and then they find 25 million horsepower. It's a bad. I understand why they want to do it and I, I don't disagree with the sentiment, but I feel like there is no way that that can be executed successfully. Yeah, we talked about this before that I, I think every season they should just have a uh, this is your target horsepower out of like each component. And then the better you can do engineering those components to hit that horsepower, the the better you can be. Because like if you make a more optimal engine that can output 800 horsepower, like great, you save fuel and start the race with less fuel. So there's still room in there to design and improve with still having some sort of e- engine equalization. Right. Same power, different profile. Right. Because, like, yeah, if everybody's putting 800 horsepower out of the internal combustion unit, fantastic. But, like, how are you doing that? Are you, say, burning oil to do that? Indeed. Uh, any more spicy takes and rumors, or should we move on to wrap-up? Uh, we, got our, we got our summer break predictions. Yes. Do we have summer break predictions? Oh, wait, sorry. I see you say, no, no, I, I'm, 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 I can't read this. Let me try this again. <clears throat> So should we move on to our wrap up with our crazy but plausible summer predictions? I, I think so. Um, you know, we'll be we're going to do a summer mid season break episode, so we're just kind of predicting what we think might happen over the summer break, and uh, we'll be back to talk about the Dutch GP in a little bit. Okay. The first item we've got here is uh, Otmar in AlphaTauri, uh, and this can't happen because they've already signed the new team, new team principal from Ferrari, uh, who finally left Ferrari this week to start. Uh, I think in November at AlphaTauri. So it's not it's not Bonato either. It's not Bonato either. It's uh, Mekis, I think, is the guy that's going for it, the sporting director. Well, I'm interested to see. I, I assume we're going to get some Otmar news over the break because he made some sort of comment of he has he's excited to implement his vision at this new team. He can't this new job. He can't talk about yet. I I just can't work out which team it would be because you've got it's not going to be Mercedes. It's not going to be Red Bull. It's not going to be Ferrari. It's not going to be Alpha Tori. It's not going to be Williams. It's not going to be Haas, because Gunter, which leaves you with Sauber and McLaren? But McLaren has somebody lined up. It, not not just lined up, they have they, it's, uh, uh, the other Andreas. Maybe we're thinking about this all wrong. Maybe it's like the Aston Martin hypercar program. And that's like something along the lines of like, oh, could it bleed back into the F1 team sort of thing? Interesting, but he got unceremoniously fired from... Uh, Aston Martin. Yeah, so we'll give him a... Yeah, that's true. So, like, Aston's probably not it. it I, I, if, if I was a betting man, it's either Formula E or WEC. Andretti. Oh! Yes! I forgot about that. I like it. The timeline works, too. It gives him three years to... Oh, yes! Yes! It, and it's also like, I can be in on the ground and implement my vision from day one. It's Andretti. You are correct. 
Yes. All right, I'll scratch out yes. Alpha Tauri and write Andretti. Okay, we'll take that. I'll I will subscribe to that. See, this is better. We we shouldn't do our crazy predictions ahead of time because like, you know, we were able to get, to work that out that he's going to Andretti. You heard it here first. Oh, that's good. breaking news. Uh, I thought, oh. man, if we get that one right, like beautiful, beautiful. Uh, next one. Uh, I think this one's just such a slam dunk. I can't I can't see how this isn't possible. I'll be shocked if this isn't true. Uh, yeah, George posts a shirtless picture on a beach. There, there is nothing more summer break than uh, George posting a shirtless picture on a beach. That means I will have to go check his Instagram, which I don't do. Yeah, slam dunk though, slam dunk. Uh, and the last one here is uh, cycling content. Yeah, I think uh, I, a Tiffany has signed up for uh, Steamboat Gravel. I would not. Spri- it's the it's August twentieth, so it makes so Valtteri has the week free before he has to go back to do uh, the Dutch Grand Prix. Uh, I think we're going to get some uh, Valtteri Bottas, Tiffany Cromwell cycling content. I thought you said the race in Zandvoort was the 21st. No, it's the 26, 27, 28, or whatever, 25, 26, 27. Oh, no, you're right. Okay, We're, we're, we're going to okay. like probably record a podcast like that weekend about... True. I will say one thing about this prediction. Even more so than the George one, I'm pretty sure they post cycling content basically every day. Uh, so this really isn't going out there. All right, fine. Well, do you have anything you think is going to happen over the summer break? Uh, Lewis retires. Oh, you think Lewis retires? Oh, that, that's going... I don't know, man. I think that's happening. I think it's happening, which leads to the whole other conversation, which is very difficult. Who gets his seat? Alex Albon. Oh, man, he was on fire today. Man, that car, that car in Monza is going to be comically quick. I think there's a good ch- there's a there's a good chance it's not a slam dunk, but there's a good chance he's going to get a podium in uh in Monza. Uh yeah. Um Alex could get it. Um Mick could get it. No, 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 no. Mick's not. Mick, Mick is not. Mick, Mick is not ready for it. Oh, but what about uh, Toto's home for wayward drivers? It is, but he needs to. He, he never puts them in a Mercedes. He sends them somewhere else. You've got to be pretty good for if you were a wayward driver. You need to have shown the potential. The only thing, the only thing that Mick Schumacher has going for him in the context of getting Lewis's seat when he retires in two weeks' time, he's German, and Mercedes would love a German back in that car. That is true. That's my only spicy hot take for the break because the other ones have been destroyed because they already happened, which was they fired Otmar and they fired Nick DeBries and Danny Ricciardo's back in a car. That's what my, I had my bets placed on that. They all, see, this is the problem with having Spa before the summer break. <laughs> exactly. They got confused as exactly I predicted would happen. We nailed, so we nailed that one. Perfect. Absolutely <laughs> spot on. Uh, anything else we need to talk about? Uh, I don't think so. Uh, we'll we'll figure it out for the mid we'll make sure we have a good stream of consciousness going in our text chat so we can actually have something to talk about over the the summer break yes i'm still unsure exactly what we're going to talk about but we will come up with something amazing well we we need to look back at our uh, our bahrain season predictions and see how well they're going i think they're going terribly i like that i like that and maybe we should do a tot up of all the predictions we've done and see whether if, throughout the season and see how many have come to, come to fruition oh i don't i don't want those stats yeah, fair point. It'll be like looking at a uh, like Lance's share of Aston's uh, tra- constructors points. Thirty percent's good enough, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Thirty percent—that's not bad. Not <laughs> hey, complain. hey! If you're a baseball player, that's great. Yeah, baseball—the world's most boring sport. It's a, it's, it's a pastime. Psh, too much effort. <laughs> uh, should we wrap up? I think so. Is it your turn or my turn? It's your turn. I hope that stays in. Uh, so thanks for listening for another week to Tinfoil Helmets. Uh, we are waiting for your feedback. Uh, let us know your conspiracies, feedback, and wants uh, to feedback at tinfoilhelmets.com. And remember to tell your friends to listen, like, rate, and subscribe to the world's greatest F1 podcast. Uh, especially if Otmar is going to Andretti. We're, we're like, we are the best if that happens. That's going to be nice.